right. Very good. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, just gather in your presence today and pray that uh, we will get closer and closer to you. I love the, the message this morning. Just how many witnesses do we have sitting right here in this room? Lord, I thank you for that encouragement today that we can be witnesses and uh, just declare you boldly in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. So how'd y'all like Chase's message today? Wasn't that good? Yeah, if you get a chance, uh, if you get a chance to encourage him, do so. I thought that was that was great. A uh, couple of quick announcements. Uh, what's happening next week? The gift, right? Everybody ready for the gift? So what do you what do you need to do? Get out there, out online. Thank you. Get out online, and show up. Yeah, register, register for our class time is what you'll see out there. And then uh, show up for meal packing. We've got a birthday in the house. That, uh, where did he go? He left. That's unacceptable, right? Hey, how many people have birthday cards that remember to, okay, have your birthday cards out, okay? And when he comes back in, we'll, yeah, we'll yell happy birthday and uh, stand up and personally carry your birthday card. No, that's not him. That's close. So, Scott and Stephanie, I want to come up and be ready to sing a few hymns. And uh, and when, yeah. So when he when he comes in, we'll uh, we'll we'll say happy birthday. Yeah, and we'll give him cards. Hey, happy birthday! There, you get on that side because it's short. I don't know if you could all read the screen when they had that slideshow, but it was uh, things that happened in 1963. And Russell, it's hard for me to imagine. It's been 80 years since 1963. And I just want to wish you a happy birthday. I, you know how I hate weddings, and my wife hypothesizes that it's because the bride is the center of attention and not me. And so, uh, but uh, yeah, I did get a little choked up there. So we are in Joshua. If I, I can't focus on that or I'll, I'll break down. We are in Joshua, and just to give you a little bit of where, we're, where I would like to get us to, I want to get through the book of Joshua and start Luke and have the story of the birth of Christ uh, sometime close to Christmas. And there's 24 chapters in Joshua. Typically, we teach one chapter a week. You can tell I've got three in here today, and I'm going to try to high step through it. And I actually think that we'll finish in plenty of time to start the book of Luke. And so I may slide in uh, another lesson more topical, which I rarely do something on heaven or angelology, uh, the study of angels, uh, because those kinds of things are fascinating. And so that might push us to get to Luke uh, just a little bit later in December, if that's okay. So <clears throat> last week, we had, we started off with a recount of the kings that had been defeated by Moses and the kings that had been defeated by Joshua. And you'll recall that it was kind of a crescendo of praise as they called off every single one and said, this king won, this king won, up to a total of all of these kings. And we, we learned a little bit about giants, the giants that were in the land. And we saw around where Goliath was, with the spear that weighed um, 40 pounds and was 26 inches long and uh, some of those kinds of things. And we talked about inheritance and how inheritance is something that we don't earn, that it was a gift from God. This land was a gift from God to the Israelites that they didn't deserve, but they were going to have to do something to claim it. And we'll talk about it. They failed to claim much of this land, and it'll come up today. So with that, let's kick off. 
These are the inheritance that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and a half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and a half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Josh, Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in with their pasture lands for their livestock and their subsistence. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. So this is called the land of Canaan because these are the Canaanites that live there. That's easy. And this is the region of Palestine. So there's a region of Palestine. We learned last week that that comes from the name Philistines. And this is Israel's territory. And it says, which Eleazar, the priest, Eleazar is Aaron's son. When they were at Kadesh Barnea, which we'll talk about today, and they had finished their 38 years of wandering they start heading south away from Israel because they've got to enter the promised land from the east and cross the Jordan. And on that way, on Mount Hor, Aaron reaches the end of his life, and Moses goes up with Aaron and Eleazar, and they literally start taking the vestments off of Aaron. Aaron is like getting ready to die, and they're taking these vestments off, and they're putting them on Eleazar. And Eleazar will be the high priest as they cross over. And their inheritance in verse 2 was by Lot. So let's go down to Numbers 26, 52 through 56. So this is the instructions to Moses. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Among these lands shall be divided for inheritance according to the number of names. To the large tribe you shall give a large inheritance, and to a small tribe you'll give a small inheritance. But the land, verse 55, will be divided by Lot. We don't know what this means. There are over 70 references to lots that are cast to make various decisions. The last lot that was passed in the Bible took place when they chose Matthias to replace Judas, the priest. And that's because the Holy Spirit came after that. So we should not be casting lots of lot. Now, in Psalm, Proverbs, it says, Proverbs 16 33, it says, the lot is cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. So they were using the lot to determine God's will, and we know that there was something to this because of the strategic location of the tribes. For instance, the tribe of Judah, which is which the scepter is going to come from, which, which Christ will come from, which David will come from. The tribe of Judah was allotted a piece of land that included Jerusalem. Um, and so, and David made that the, uh, the city of David. So we know in John 16, 13, that when the spirit of truth comes, this is Jesus talking right near the end. When the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he'll declare to you the things that are to come. We are to live by the Holy spirit, not by casting lots. Um, one of the one of the lot casting, can you go to the stained glass? So you see them casting, that they're proposing that this would look like dice. We don't even know what it looked like. Many people believe it was flat stones. Um, one would be yes, one would be no, but this is remembering the day of atonement. And on the day of atonement, when Eleazar or the whoever the high priest was would go into the tent of meaning, into the holy of holies, he would, on the Day of Atonement, he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat from one of two rams. And one is called the scapegoat. And so they would cast lots. One would be sacrificed. And on the other one, he would put his hands, representing putting all of the sins of Israel on this goat, this scapegoat. And he would carry, and that goat would be released into the wilderness, symbolic of taking the sins of Israel away. Both of the goats represent Christ, taking the sins away and the blood of Christ. So let's go back up to Joshua um, 14. 
So it references nine and one half tribes. You know, last week, the land, two and a half tribes, as it says later on, their, their portion is on the east side of the Jordan, which they never should have been there. They should have gone into the Holy Land, this into Canaan. And so we have nine and a half tribes on one side, two and a half tribes on the other, that's 12. And then we have the 13th tribe, which is Levi. And Levi is not apportioned any land. <clears throat> As we talked about last week, Levi and Simeon were cursed because they had, they had gone in excess to revenge, to bring vengeance on the raper of their sister Dinah. And so Simeon, we'll see in a minute, it has a little piece of land right in the midst of Judah, and they will eventually just disappear into Judah, according to the curse. Levi, who was somewhat redeemed um, at, the re at the bull, at sacrifice uh, at Mount Sinai, they basically won their good graces back from God, but they would never inherit any land. They're interspersed. So no portion was given to the Levites. By the way, don't be, don't be nervous about all the scriptures. We'll get through it. I'll talk fast. And if we don't, I'll stop right in the middle of it. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since that time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day, for you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him and he gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. Therefore, Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. So we, th this was interesting studying about an 85-year-old man still being as strong as he was on my birthday yesterday at 60. And so I, I realized that at 85, you can still have old man fight. And so I learned from my father that old man fight, never fight an old man because he will get you in places you have no idea you even have. And so the people are still at Gilgal. They have, this is their camp where they have set up the tabernacle just across the Jordan, and they are conquering this land from beside the Jordan. They're going up into the hill country. They're going to the coastal places. They're going into the lowlands down by the Jordan River. And we find out that Caleb is not actually an Israelite. He is not a Jew. He is Jephuna the Kenizzites. He is this, it's believed that the Kenizzites joined Israel during the drought and they became proselytes, meaning they converted to Judaism as a religion, but they're actually descendants of Esau. And so Caleb is not apportioned any of the land, but he, is, he was the spy that went in and in Numbers 13, Caleb quiets the people. Ten of these guys are like, we can't take them. Caleb quiets them down before Moses, and he said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able to overcome it. And the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. And they are, and so they brought Israel a bad report, and net, net, they melted. It says their hearts melted because they were afraid of the giants. 
Caleb believed what God said. God had promised that he would drive them out. In Isaiah 55, 8, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. And Caleb knew that even though that there were giants, and this is talking about Anakim, those are the giants. Nephilim, Rephim, and Anakim are all giants. Arba is a giant. And he, this, this will be great in just a second. Let's go back up. Verse 8, the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. This was not like my son that jumped on the bandwagon with the Rangers, who's an Astros fan. This is, this is right from the start, 100% all in. Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance to you and your children forever. He wasn't allotted land. Because he did that, they were going to reward him with land. And he says it's been 45 years. So he was 40 when he goes in. They're at Kadesh Barnea. We'll come back to that. They're at the far southern tip of Israel. They go due north. And then... They come back to Kadesh Barnea. And when he goes, he's 40 years old. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and I'm getting forgetful because you just took me off track. <laughs> it's been 45 years since he was a spy. And we know that they wandered 38 years. So there was almost two years before they sent the spies in. They were getting God's law on Mount Sinai, 30, which this means that they were fighting for seven years. Seven years they're going after it, and he is he is all in. And he says he is, he's got just the same strength for war, for going in and coming. Now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. You heard on that day how the Anakim were there. He's like, give me this land where the giants are. I want this land. And he says, it says it may, it's the, a better translation is it will be, it will be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. If God said it, he believed it. He absolutely was all in and he gave him Hebron. The reason he wanted this is because it was some of the most fertile fertile ground there was. There are approximately 1.2 million grapevines in Israel. Over half of them are in the Hebron region. And it didn't matter if giants are there because he believed what God had said. And he was going to execute. One of my wonderful stories of my wife was when I was teaching on Revelation and we learned that we're going to be with Christ when he comes in to fight. And I asked her, do you think you're going to be able to do that? She's like, well, I'm with Christ. So, yes, I'm in. I'm all in. I'm like, wow, I'm not even all in. I'm a little nervous to go to war. And so he gets Hebron. And now the name of Hebron is formerly was Kiriath Arba. And we'll come back to that in a second. Kiriath means town. Uh, Beth means uh, home. So we'll, we'll talk about Bethel in a minute. It's not Bethel. So let's keep rolling. <clears throat> the allotment for the tribes of the people of Judah, according to their clans, reached southward to the boundary of Edom, to the wilderness of Zin at the farthest south. And their south boundary ran from the end of the Salt Sea, from the bay that faces southward. It goes out southward to the ascent of Akrabim, passes along to Zin, and goes up south to Kanesh Barnea, along by Hezron up to Adder, turns out to Kar Karka, passes along to Asmon, goes out by the brook of Egypt, and comes to its end at the sea. This shall be your south boundary. The, the east boundary is the Salt Sea, to the mouth of the Jordan, and the boundary goes up to... If this was a default, skip the light. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I was doing. Okay. And the boundary goes up to Debir from the Valley of Achor. Then the boundary goes up by the valley of the son of Hanan at the southern shoulder of the Jebusites, that is Jerusalem. And the boundary goes up to the top of the mountain that lies over the valley of Hinnon 
on the west, at the northern end of the Valley of Rephim. And the west boundary was the Great Sea with its coastline. This is the boundary around the people of Judah, Judah according to their clans. According to the commandment of the Lord of Joshua, he gave to Caleb the son of Jehunath a portion among the people of Judah, Kirath Arba, that is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak, and Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, and Ahaman, and Talmai the descendants of Anak, and he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kirath Sefer, and Caleb said, whoever strikes Kirath Sefer and captures it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. And Othanel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it, and he gave him Asha, his daughter, as wife. When he came to when she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field. And she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of the Negeb, giving me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. I can't take out all the hard names. That's just what that's the way I am. So we start with Judah. The two and a half tribes are on the east, and now they're coming up tribe by tribe, and I think they're coming up in a certain order, and they bring up Judah first. Now, Judah is actually the fourth son of Leah. So Reuben was the firstborn, and then Simeon and Levi. So normally you would have started with Reuben, but you'll remember from weeks gone by that Reuben committed a grave sin against his father. Anybody remember what it was? He slept with his concubine, which all fathers hate. They don't want their sons doing that. And so he was cursed. And then Simeon and Levi, we already know, are both cursed because of the over actions in revenging their, and bringing vengeance for their sister. So Judah would actually camp in the most prominent place. At the camp, they would be on the eastern side. We've seen that. And in this, down in verse 3, we see that their border goes to the south of Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is where the 12 spies went north. Now Kadesh Barnea is actually in the tribal country of Judah. And the boundary goes up in verse 7 to Debir from the valley of Achor. We've heard about Achor before. Do you remember, remember the sin at Jericho? What was the sin? Achan, a man named Achan, which means trouble, took some of the devoted things that were supposed to be devoted to God. And they suffered defeat at Ai. They didn't ask the counsel of God. They sent men in, and they were crushed. And this Achan, once they found out who it was, coming person by person, tribe by tribe, they're instructed to stone him and his family and burn them in the valley of Achor, which is the Valley of Trouble. Both those names mean trouble. And then the boundary goes up by the Sea of the Son of Hinnom and the southern border of the Jebusite, that is Jerusalem. This is the second time Jerusalem is mentioned in the Bible. And the boundary goes up to the mountain that lies over the Valley of Hinnom. This is the Valley of Gehenna. This is, this was what Christ used as a metaphor for hell the valley of hinnom intersected with the valley if you if you go over to jerusalem i wouldn't go now but if you go over to jerusalem and you're on the mount of olives you look across to the eastern gate the valley of kidron and on the other side valley of hinnom intersects and during christ's time and during even prior to that they would burn their garbage there. It was constantly burning. It was constantly stinky. And in the early days, when they failed to push out the Canaanites, some of the Israelites actually sacrificed their children passing through the fire in this valley to the god Moloch. Um, and it's directly related to them not doing what they're supposed to do, the We'll see it today. They don't do what they're supposed to do in driving out the Canaanites. So let's look at the picture of Hinnom. So there it is today. 
in Christ's time that would have been burning, he would have looked over at it and he would have said, that's hell. That is what hell is. All right, let's go back up. Verse 12, the great sea is the med. The boundary for the people of Judah includes Jerusalem. It includes the Temple Mount part of, uh, part of Jerusalem is actually in another tribe. According to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, verse 13, he gave Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the people of Judah, Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron. David will rule from Hebron for seven years until he takes Jerusalem. Um, you, we see in here today that did not take Jerusalem. And they say they could not, but they means they would not take Jerusalem. It would be until David established control of Jerusalem, he set up Jerusalem as the city of David, which would be which would be the ruling place of Israel and will be the ruling place of Israel in the end times. Arba is a word that its name it means two things. Arba to the Jews is is the is the number four. And in great Bible story, Abram, Abraham rather, when Sarah passed away, she was 127 years old. And they are here. They're in this very location, but he doesn't have any land. He doesn't doesn't have anything, and the Hittites are there. And he's got to find a place to bury Sarah. And so the Hittites say, just put her in any one of these caves. And he's, no, no, I, I need to pay for this so that I can claim it as my own. And uh, he said, what about this, the cave of Machpelah? And the owner comes up and he says, no, just bury your dead. Just take it. And um, Abram says, Abraham says, no, I want, I want to pay for it. And this guy says, well, land like this is worth 400 shekels, but what's 400 shekels between you and me? Just go ahead and bury her. And so he pays the 400 shekels, and Abram, Abraham is buried there. Isaac is buried there. Jacob is buried there. And the Jews have concocted a belief that Adam is buried there as well, representing four. Joseph was actually embalmed in Egypt, and so he is not buried there, but it's there to this day. Hebron is not a good, definitely not a good place to be in today. Okay, and so he comes down, whoever strikes, this is verse 16, whoever strikes Kiriath Sefer and captures it, to him I will give Aksa, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it. Do you get that? That's this is this is literally kissing cousins. I mean, these are cousins. His brother so this is his I guess this is his nephew and his son-in-law all all in one thing. This is like from Arkansas, right? So by the way, Carolyn was born in Arkansas and my mother's family is from Arkansas, but we're not first cousins. I won't go into that. So let's go to the other thing about Othniel. He, in the next book, next book after Joshua is Judges, he is the first judge. So let's go down to Judges 3, 7 through 11. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreth which is the, the female consort of Baal. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the land of hard name, the king of Mesopotamia. Verse 9, but when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer, and his name is Othniel, the son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was on him, and he judged Israel, and he went to the war, and he went to war, and the Lord gave him the king of Mesopotamia into his hand. So this is, this guy is fighting. It's, Caleb has, Caleb has conquered three of these giants. And evidently, he's like, okay, let's, let somebody else get in on this party now, and they'll get my daughter. And they will give, they gave him the land, going back up, the last, they gave him, hold on. Verse 18, so she came to him, he had given her land, and it was the Negev, desert. And so 
she's pretty brave herself. And she goes up and says, okay, you've given me this land in the South, but it's desert. How about, how about you bless me again? And so he gives her the upper and lower springs of water. So, This is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Judah according to their clans. The cities belonging to the tribe of the people of Judah in the extreme south toward the boundary of Edom were in all 29 cities with their villages and in the lowland 14 cities with their villages, 16 cities with their villages, nine cities with their villages, Ekron with its towns and its villages from Ekron to the sea, all that were by the side of Ashdod with their villages. Ashdod, its towns and its villages, Gaza, its towns and its villages, to the brook of Egypt and the great sea with its coastline, and in the hill country, 11 cities with their villages. Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, and Zior, nine cities with their villages, 10 cities with their villages, six cities with their villages, two cities with their villages. In the wilderness, the city of Salt and Engadi, six cities with their villages. But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem, Jerusalem to this day. So as she's saying, six cities, eight cities, all of this, that's generally in a geographic region. So there would be like five different groups of these cities grouped together in the hill country or in the lowland or or. Um, along the coastal region. And so the, the Negev is the extreme south, which is desert. And you come down to verse the end of verse 32, and it says, in all, 29 cities and their villages. And if you count all of the villages that are up above that, you come to 36. And people look at that and see, look, the Bible has errors. But these seven cities are in the tribe of Simeon, which is right in the middle. And so there's 29 cities, there's 36 listed that are that are in Judah, and Judah runs the entire circumference, is, is it a, that's the word, around Simeon, and those seven cities are in there. So we come to verse 46, and we see the name Ashdod, Gaza, and that is the Philistines territory. That is exactly Gaza Strip right now. And it they bordered the Great Sea, which is the Med, all the way up into the into the hill country of Judah. Um, all those cities that are listed is the hill country. And then we come to the city of Salt, which is believed to be Qumran and En Gedi. So that is down in the south. Have any of you ever heard of the Qumran caves? So the Qumran cave in 1947, a shepherd boy, a Bedouin, a, a Palestinian, was, it's been told that he was throwing rocks into a cave and he heard something break. But he discovers in these caves old writing and it actually dates 2,000 years. They sell some to antique dealers. It takes several years before they end up rec realizing how old this is. And there were there were multiple discoveries. They have discovered 947 different texts from over 2,000 years ago. And it was believed from the sect of the Essenes. So you've heard of the Pharisees, the Sadducees. There was a separate group called the Essenes that lived off on their own. And it's believed that they kept all of these 2,000-year-old texts, the oldest Old Testament text that exists was found at En Gedi, and it helped, excuse me, at Qumran, and it helped validate Bible scholars' belief that our Bible is accurate. And so it's a big, big deal. And En Gedi is in very close by. En Gedi, you'll see down in the bottom right, the caves. En Gedi is, you remember Crazy Saul? Saul was the first king. And he literally was crazy. And David would go off and fight. And as he would come in, it would the people would say, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And crazy Saul decides, okay, I'm going to kill David. 
He tries to pin him with a spear. David takes off, and he is running all over Israel. And at En Gedi, they hear Saul is fight, fighting the Philistines. He comes back, and they say, David is in En Gedi. And he gets 3,000 men to go into En Gedi, into the caves of En Gedi. And so he needs to relieve himself. Saul, this is literally in the Bible. I'm not making this up. He has to relieve himself. And so he goes into a cave. And lo and behold, in the back of the cave is David and his men. And his men whisper to him and say, now's your chance. You can get him. You can kill him. And he won't do it. He goes up to him and he cuts off the corner. You know, Jews have these four corners of their robe. He cuts off one of the corners of his robe. And as Saul, Saul unbeknownst to Saul, as Saul goes back up and mounts up, David comes out and says, see, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And Saul feels guilty, momentarily guilty, and says, you're a better man than me, and rides off until he goes crazy again and tries to kill him again. But that happened in En Gedi. So um, verse 63, but the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah, the people of Judah could not drive them out. And that doesn't, that's not right. They would not drive them out. They had been given the promise of this land, and God would have driven them out, but they would not drive them out. The allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan to Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel, then going from Bethel to Luz, it passes along to Adaroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Jephalites, as far as the ter territory of lower Beth Horon, then to Gez Gezir, and then the ends in the sea. The people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. So Bethel is, Beth is, I said house, El is God. So you have El Shaddai and, and those name, different names for God. El means God. So Bethel is house of God. And this is where Abram, when he had first been given the promise, he built an alt, the promise to that he would inherit the land and his descendants would be numerous. He'd be the father of many nations. He built an altar at Bethel. Uh, in honor of that. And later, Jacob comes to this place. He's tired. He lays on a rock, and he has this vision of Jacob's ladder, the stairway, with angels going up and down. And to us, the ladder represents Christ, basically allowing us to traverse between earth and God. And so this is where that is. Lower Beth Horon. Beth Horon, we remember, is one of the first battles where God cast down the hailstones and starts killing the enemy. However, in verse 10, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. That's not the command. The command was to be all in, to wipe them out. And the reason they worshiped Asherah and all these other gods is because they did not, they were not all in. Let's go to the map. So Ephraim and Manasseh are right in the middle of the most fertile ground. And that's because Joseph was chosen. Joseph, basically, his two sons were adopted by Jacob. And these two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, got the best land. So Judah goes first, and then the favorite, Joseph, go, goes next with the best allotment. And that's it. So let's go to Numbers 14.24. I love that go all in. This is Jeff's, this is Jeff's talent, not mine, but all in. Caleb should be our example, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, has followed me fully, and I will bring into the land which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. 
Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow, set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. This is the promise he makes to Caleb right before they turn south because God's not going to let him go in the promised land. And it says he has a different spirit. You know, we are, Paul said we're supposed to be strangers and aliens. We're supposed to have a different spirit than everyone. Christians are supposed to be all in for God, First Kings. And may your heart be fully committed to the Lord our God to live by his decrees and to obey his commands. God wants us to be Caleb's. He wants us to be fully all in, be different, be noticeably different. And Colossians says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everything that we're supposed to do is supposed to honor Jesus, and that is the way that we're different. Any questions? I know that is, that's hard. By the way, it's hard for me to go through all of that. Um, and we will, that's why we're going to try to accelerate as much as we can. Uh, I do enjoy making the readers do some of those names. Russell, the Qunran Caves, because we were there. Now, do you mind if I share a little yeah. footage? <laughs> so we went on an Israel trip, as y'all know, back in 2017, I think. You remember this? And so uh, Jeff Warwick is around there. Quite a few. Scott, there we go. And... Uh, and so we're standing there, and uh, we decided we'd get a little creative. So we got some live footage of really the story that took place when those uh, uh, when those were found. Oops, let me see. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, we're just in awe of the way that you work in in our lives, and uh, we thank you for all these prayer requests that have been lifted up, and uh, just as uh, as Chase said this morning, you know we we all we all walk around. And we've got uh, struggles that we're going through. We've got praises. We've got confusion. We've got some messed up uh, things going on. And Lord, we just we just thank you that uh, that we need you for everything. We need you to help us through those difficult times, for for wisdom, for guidance, for our family. And uh, Lord, we just pray that we can we can make a difference in this community and beyond. And uh, Lord, we just Thank you for that challenge that you give us to to be beacons of light and and ministers uh, to those around us. Just continue to give us hope, and courage, and not uh, and not not stop doing the things that you would call us to do. So I pray that we will go out and do that this week in Christ's name. Amen. All right. See y'all next week.